My name is Earl Willis Jr. Today is July the 12th, 2017, and we're in Bowling Green, Kentucky. And today we're talking to uh, David DeMeo. DeMeo. Uh, Mr. DeMeo, where and when were you born? I was born in 1964, April 8th, in Quincy, Massachusetts, okay. which is outside Boston. Okay. Uh, my, my mother is from, uh, she was born and raised in Weymouth. Yeah, it's right I, next door. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's pretty neat. Uh, did you, uh, so you went to high school and grade school there? I did, yes. Okay. Uh, where, uh, did you have any parents, uh, uh, siblings, cousins, aunts, uncles that was in the military? I had, my father was in the Army during the Korean War. He was drafted, served three years, hated the whole time. Okay. Uh, so he didn't like the army, and that was that was about it. So I mean, we were not from a military family. I'd never been on a military base or anything like that before I joined. Okay. Okay. So did you ever? So you said your father uh, didn't really like the experience. So you probably didn't talk much about the military, the army, really. Uh, not really. But I mean, he was drafted when he was like 18, and okay. I mean, he went to the Korean War, went to combat. And that was all he ever saw, so we didn't get a very, you know, very pleasant picture yeah, of it. I understand. Uh, so, did you have any other, like, grandparents or uncles or aunts or...? Not really. My grandparents were, all of them were recent immigrants. Okay. So, like, we're not, you know, not even here okay. long enough to be, you know, to be brought into the military. And so, yeah, I was, I was really the first one. I didn't, I didn't have any siblings go in the, the military ever or anything like that. Okay. Uh, what were you doing before you entered the service? Well, I was in high school, so I went, I mean, I went straight from high school to West Point. That's where I went to the military academy. So when I was a senior in high school, I applied to West Point and got in. So, I mean, I, I didn't even have much of a summer vacation. So I went straight from graduation of high school right into West Point. So that was Quincy? Yeah, okay. Quincy Banks. So uh, how did you make a decision to West Point? What was what led you up to going to West Point when you got out of high school? Well, it's, it's, I knew that I wanted, for a long time, I knew that I wanted to go into the military in, in some fashion. I was like in junior ROTC in high school, uh, and, and so I knew I wanted in some way or another to go into West Point and I think we visited there when I was in high school and I was very impressed with the place. I mean if you go there and see it, see the cadets on parade, it's very impressive and so I mean the school had a very good reputation so to me that looked like it was a, it was a challenge and it would be something that would be uh, great to do so I ended up yeah. spending a large chunk of my adult life there. Uh so I guess did, I guess it's real interesting to me that because I guess most people when they're thinking about going going the way they're not thinking about West Point. That's that's pretty uh, prestigious, it, right? Yeah, uh, I guess so. uh, did you know? Did you like study study about it before you went there? Know the history of it, or I, I I did I did I mean I studied a lot. I read a lot about. I thought I knew a lot about it, but it's like anything else you can read books and then there's yeah. uh, the reality and it's sort of it's you know it's a closed place so you can you can see the outside you can see the cadets on parade but you can't really experience okay. their life till you get there so it's uh, for, for the people who've never been to West Point or know about West Point can you tell give like a brief summary or where it's at what state it is and sure. like kind of explain what it's about Sure. Well, West Point is located in uh, New York State. It's located in upstate New York uh, along the Hudson River. Now, it's a very beautiful location along the river, but it's also very, very remote. It's up in the mountains along the river, and that's how it got started originally. It was uh, It's the oldest post in the, in the U.S. Army, and it started in the Revolutionary War, General Washington, uh, as, a, as a fort to guard the Hudson River, and that's reason it was established is because it's such a difficult place to get to, yeah. which is great for defense. It's not so great if you're driving in and out. Uh, yeah. But it was established in 1802, so it's the, the longest continuous uh, post in the, in the military. 
uh, as a military academy. It was the first military academy uh, in Annapolis followed and then the Air Force Academy. And for a while that's where all Army officers graduated from. Now okay. it's only about a quarter graduate from there. Most graduate from ROTC programs. Okay. Uh, now you would probably know this. You probably knew the history of West Point Hall I do. But didn't people like uh, was it Custer? Custer went to West Point. Did uh, did, uh, uh, did Lee General Lee? Lee Grant Sherman Patton MacArthur. Uh, all those folks. And I mean everything is named after these people because, like I said, up to. To a certain point, that's where all Army officers went to. So uh, all, the, all the Civil War generals, uh, you know, though that era, most of the World War II generals, they were all West Point graduates. Now it's not so much the case. So okay. um, now, you know, most of the, the generals that you see on television and uh, you know on the news are not necessarily West Point graduates. Those Schwarzkopf. General Schwarzkopf was, Colin Powell was okay. not, so okay. it's, nowadays it's not, okay. not as big an issue. Uh, was there a reason why you picked the, the uh, Army over any other parts of the branches? Uh, well, it was because of West Point, which is sort of, I guess in retrospect, it seems maybe kind of silly, but um, because I, I, you know, I think I like the Air Force better, I like the idea of flying. But it's when, when, you, when you see West Point, it's quite, a, quite an impressive place, and so that really, yeah. that really impressed me a lot. Um, and, I, and that's how I ended up you know, going into the Army was because of that, which is, is, is a major, I didn't know it at the time, but when I later went back as faculty, I mean, that's a major reason that West Point exists as a way of attracting people into the Army because okay. it's a, you know, it's a top rated university, it can compete with the Ivy Leagues and so forth. And so people who you know, might go to Wall Street or go to medical school, that's a gateway for them into the Army. So I can, I can say in my case, that's the way it worked. Uh, can you hold this one second? I'm sorry. So you said that West Point was a pretty pop popular, uh, very historic place where a lot of generals went. Yeah. Uh, so you said that's not really the case now? Well, well it is to some extent. About 25% of Army officers graduate from West Point and the rest you know, come from ROTC, so there's still okay. some. But it, there was a time when that's where everybody came from. Okay. What did your parents think about you going to West Point? Um, hmm. That's hard to say. I mean, I, I guess they... They accepted it. I mean, okay. they, weren't, they weren't that excited about it. Yeah, you said your dad kind of had a bad experience yeah. with Oh, yeah, he, he definitely didn't yeah. like the idea of me going into the Army. Yeah. May have been right. Uh, so, did you, uh, can you remember, do you remember leaving to go to, to West Point? Was that, uh, like, you remember when, like, the, the season? Or? Oh, yes, exactly. Yeah, it was on uh, the 1st of July. Okay. You know, have basic training starts there, and so you know we had to drive up to to West Point. When everybody gets their their head shaved, yeah. and you turn in your clothes and get a, get a uniform, and so yeah, of course it's I mean, first of July. In New York is very hot and humid. This was before air. I mean, air, there was air conditioning, but not not yeah. at the barracks where we live. That's for sure. Yeah. So yeah, I remember that quite, quite distinctly. Uh, what was the, what was your average day like in, 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 uh, in uh, when you first started? It was very long. Very I mean, long. it was very long. I mean, you start start in the morning with physical training, and you know, getting out and exercising, which is you know, it's, you're you're out in the grass and it's sticky and humid, and yeah. you know. I'd, tried to get in shape. I mean, I was never an athlete, so yeah. Yeah, I knew I had to get in shape before I went there, so I had, had tried to run and so forth, but there's there's a big difference between exercising by yourself, going out and running by yourself, and yeah. running in a formation yeah. with a whole bunch of people in lockstep, which is, you, you can't prepare for that. Yeah. And, and, and so, that, I mean, that, that was the start of the day, and then of course, we all ate in the mess hall. The thing with the West Point mess hall is that all look at that, it's all 4,000 of them eat at once. It's the, the largest mess hall in the okay. Army. Uh, it's a huge place. And 
I mean, at that time, it has changed, but the the new cadets are called plebes, and I mean, the idea is supposed to be tough on you. So, yeah. uh, I mean, you had to you had to eat at attention, and uh, you're pretty much getting yelled at and, and, and harassed. So, I mean, you dropped a lot of weight there. Yeah. Uh, it was not easy to eat, uh, but then I mean, pretty, pretty much training, training all day long, and then you know lectures in the evening, and so it was uh, very. Very long days, but uh, I mean, it was was interesting. I think that pretty much, you know, all all the people there were in the same boat as oh, I yeah. was. You know, there's sort of a perception, and I heard a lot of people ask, "Why are you going there? You know, are you the are you the son of a general or something?" The idea that people who go there come from a military background, but they they really don't. I mean, there was one in my unit of like 12 cadets who was. One guy whose father was in the army, and uh, one young lady. Her, her father was a general. And she she quit right at the beginning, and everybody else were you know people right out of high school like me who didn't okay. knew virtually nothing about it. And I, and I found out that that's that's by intention uh, because what the what the goal is. I mean, they, they don't want to have a you know a military aristocracy that plays like. The old German army had, or something. The idea is they want they want the army to be, or at least the leadership to be representative of the population yeah. as, as a whole. And so, much later on, years down the road, I actually ended up on the admissions committee at West Point, being one of the ones who chooses people who come in. Okay. And that's specifically what we were looking for: is not people from a military background, but you know, a slice of society. So we, we were looking for Eagle Scouts and. Yeah. Class presidents and people who are not military by nature to sort of, sort of have the uh, the army, sort of represent okay. the population. You know, unfortunately now in recent years, and particularly since the Iraq War, um, that's that's sort of not been the case. It's only a small group of people who are going into the army, and a lot of them are sons and daughters of former military people. So there's really a gap. That's, that's growing. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, how long uh, would you would you call it boot camp, or you would call it boot camp? Would yeah, it's basic training. Yeah. How long? Did, how many months was that? That was six weeks. Six weeks. And then when that ended, I mean, then you went into the academic okay. year because it was still it's still a university. Now in the summer it was just military training. But what kind of classes would you take? Would it be like uh, like uh, being a leader, leadership training? Or? Uh, there was. We had some of that, but again, it's a university, so everything we had, it took calculus. I mean, that first year, calculus, English, French, okay. geography. Um, West Point started out as an engineering school, so it's still very heavy on the math and the engineering. And so I remember the, the first year, the classes were, were not that much fun, or things like calculus yeah. and so forth that were not. Uh, fun. And later on, as you went on, you get to take psychology and art, and history, and yeah. more of the more of the fun stuff. Yeah. Were the, were the teachers were they civilians or were they officers? For the most part, the majority of them are army officers and still are. Um, we have a master's degree. Uh, there are some civilian teachers there uh, to sort of have a plan, but for the most part, I think. Uh, at least my first year, I had all. I mean, they were all captains and majors in the okay. in the army. We had one navy officer, and so um, most of them were graduates as well. So they had graduated from the place like ten years okay. prior to us. Uh, so, uh, what year did you you graduate from West Point? I graduated in 1986. Okay, 86. So that's what uh, four years. Four years. So, so kind of like college. It's yeah, exactly. Like okay. College. Uh, what rank were you when you when you graduated? Oh, you, everyone graduates as a lieutenant. Lieutenant, okay. Uh, after you, you said you stayed there for quite a while, long for for what twenty, for like fifteen years. Later on, okay. Oh, I went back. Okay, so after you graduated West Point, where was your your next place? Did you uh, after you graduated, did you still went to West? Did you still? Or did no, you, no, no. Okay. No. Um, so. Yeah, I graduated from West Point in 86, and then I went to, uh, I was in military intelligence, so I went to intelligence training, which happens to be in Fort Huachuca, Arizona, which is okay. out, out in the desert. 
that's for six months. But then my I mean, my first actual duty station was in Hawaii. So okay. I was in Hawaii for four and a half years. Um, at Schofield Barracks at the 25th Infantry Division out there. Okay. Uh, and, of course, the intelligent uh, community is uh, kind of on the low-key uh, side, so I don't know how much you can talk but, about this, but what kind of things did you learn in your intelligent training? Well, that's, no, I, I definitely that's, can talk about that. It's, that's a very interesting uh, question because now, and I graduated in the 80s, so this was the, well, it wasn't the height of the Cold We thought it was the height of the yeah. Cold War. It turns out it was the end of the Cold yeah. War, but no one no one knew that. This was in the, the Reagan era. And so, I mean, we were all convinced that, you know, there was going to be a World War III yeah. against the Russians. And so everything was about the Russians. I mean, that's, that's all we did. That's all we talked. Yeah. I mean, we spent six months. And that's all we learned about was the, the Soviet army to the point of, I mean, we had to memorize every, every fact about you know, how many rifles are in a rifle company and how many trucks are in a truck platoon and, I mean, everything. Uh, and, and that's, you know, that's all we learned. But it was constantly beaten upon us that um, just over and over again, that, I mean, you, you will definitely go to war against the right. It was never an if. It was not an if. If the war starts, it's a when. Yeah. And now it's, it's sort of, now when we look at it in hindsight, I'm talking 1986, you know, the, the Berlin Wall came down three years later. Yeah. It, it sort of seems silly, but at that, at that point, yeah. um, I, I mean, we were, we were just guaranteed that this was what was going to happen uh, to us. So we, we focused so much on that to the exclusion of just about anything else. Of course, well, that's when the same time when the Soviets were in Afghanistan, right? Uh, Late 80s? Yes. Okay. Yeah. It, it was at the end of their time, and they went in in 1980, so this was the end of their time in Afghanistan. And so it's um, just to give a, you know, an idea, after, you know, after the fact, people always say, oh, well, we knew it was coming. We knew the Soviet Union was falling apart, but, I mean, they weren't. I mean, even in, in the intelligence community, everyone. Was convinced that this was, yeah. you know, and, and of course why, why the war hadn't broken out for 40 years prior to that, but it was going to break out, you know, within a day or so. Yeah. You, they could never answer, but I was, you know, that was the fact. It was going to be a war. It was going to be in in Europe, and you know, the Soviet. We had Red Dawn. Was this movie? Oh yeah, with, that was the, yeah. That was it. The Cubans helped them fight or yeah. whatever. Yeah. Paratroopers landing yeah. in, in America, and you know this is what we believed. And of course, it was uh, just a few short years later we found ourselves in the, in the new world order, and uh, I mean, nobody was really prepared for yeah. what does this, this mean? Yeah. You go from somebody that's got a, a, a uniform on to somebody who doesn't wear a uniform. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And you just focused on one thing. So. Um, so you said your so you said most of your tr your uh, intelligence training was geared towards the Soviet Union, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, even even to the point where that didn't make sense. So like I said, I, I knew I was going to Hawaii and, and so forth, which is in the Pacific. And, yeah. But you could see other things going. I mean, there was there was fighting going down in El Salvador and yeah. and so forth. But I can I can remember us being scolded by uh, you know colonels. When you know someone would ask, well, what about North Korea? What about El Salvador? And we just get this lecture, you know, you you're going to fight the Russians. You better be, don't be dis getting distracted by things like Korea and yeah. all these foolish things. Yeah. You're going to fight, and that and that was the line up until the end. I mean, interestingly, I had to go back to Fort Huachuca in 1991 because they have a basic course and then they have an advanced course for captains. Okay. And this was after the Soviet Union had collapsed, the, the Berlin Wall was gone. I mean, it was it was already gone and they were still teaching the same thing. Like, you know, don't be fooled. This is a trick. Don't oh, be yeah. fooled because they're, you know, the Soviets are still coming back and we're, we're looking at, at, at that time I and mean, people looking at this just, yeah. you know, cannot believe it. Meanwhile, we found ourselves dealing with you know, drug cartels and failed states and yeah. revolutions and terrorists and famines and yeah. things that we were not trained for at all. Yeah. We were counting tanks in a yeah. Soviet tank company. Yeah. 
So uh, uh, you are uh, you wearing your Western shirt, so you are an Arabic uh, assistant professor at Western. Yes. And so where did you learn Arabic from? Yeah, I mean, that's a, a good question. I often get that people ask me, you know, you, are you Arab or did you grow up over there? And, you know, it's a thing just like anything else, the, you know, the Army trains people. It's one of the few places you can go and, and get trained in them. I mean, they'll train you to be an x-ray technician or a mechanic or something else. Well, they have to do the same thing for, uh, for linguists as, as well. So uh, I learned Arabic in the Army. Now, what, what it was, was I went to, well, I got selected for that. I knew I wanted to do do that, do some sort of language training. So I got selected in 1992, but I didn't actually, the way the assignments work out, I didn't actually get to go to language school until 94. Okay. Now this is, we're talking right after the, the first Gulf, Gulf War, yeah. um, Desert Storm, which again is another one that caught us. Off guard. Uh, I mean, I don't know what was going on in the, in the headquarters, but just the, the general soldier population out there, I mean, in 1990, we're still thinking Soviet, Soviet. Union, and here's a war going on in, in Kuwait. Kuwait because, yeah. I mean, they're actually invading an allied country and American troops are going. So that was another one that caught us off guard, and so the Army had lots and lots of Russian linguists that they had trained, and there was a huge shortage, still is, huge shortage of Arabic linguists. So I was not surprised that I ended up going yeah. to school for for Arabic, yeah. and so that's how I, I got started on that. So how long did, how long did it take you to, to become uh, fluent enough in Arabic that you can talk every day? Sure. Yeah, so I, you know, I got to go to the Defense Language Institute, in, which is in Monterey, California, which is it's famous because of the location. It's been a very beautiful location, okay. but it's actually a, you know, a great school. And that's, I mean, the great thing about, you know, one of the things about the Army you have to give them credit for is they, they put a lot, a lot of money into education. They really do. And so uh, the Defense Language Institute is really like it's an unparalleled, uh, school, so you go there for a year and a half, and it's a full-time, all day long language school, and that's that's all we did. I mean, I mean, we didn't have any outs. We didn't have to go out and fill sandbags or paint fences or do any of that. It was language training, six hours a day in class, and then you get like three, four hours of homework. And we had uh, all our teachers were native speakers, so in our cases we had Egyptian and Iraqi and Syrian and Moroccan teachers, uh, and they were great civilians. They were all civilians because they're just you know, they're, there weren't military people to teach that. And we were in class that we had like five people in my class, and so every hour a different teacher would rotate, and that was six hours a day of that, and then you would get the homework. So. It was, you know, a great experience because, and that's what they wanted, is having an immersion environment. So, I mean, we got to the point, I mean, most of what we were talking about was current events. We'd watch Al Jazeera, we'd read okay. the newspapers, but you'd be discussing current events, reading about them and writing about them in Arabic and, okay. you know, having these so discussions. So you can write Arabic too, also? Yeah, okay. yeah, so you had, you had so they, all of that. Uh, so an Arabic they start on the right hand side? Right to left, Okay. Yeah. Okay, right from right to left, uh, and and so that's what that's what we did all day. And so the great thing is you can focus on that. So it's a, uh, the Defense Language Institute is a great. I mean, everybody wants to go there. They say, "Well, you're so lucky." It's just a great environment, uh, and they do. At the time, again, it was a transition. It used to be. I mean. The name of it used to one time used to be called the the Russian Institute, yeah. and it was mostly Russian right. schools. And then they transitioned. Now, like two out of the seven buildings there are Arabic, um, and, and but there's a, they teach like forty other languages. But now Arabic is is the biggest one. How does yeah. your how does your I mean if you're doing something like that all day how does does you did you did you, you brain this like you can't did you sometimes you have to take a break? You, I mean that's really hard. Well, I mean, that's that's the idea is you get you get used to it and it becomes natural. And so it's like, 
you know, oh, when you, when you think, and on the one hand, it's intensive because you, it's it's all Arabic. But on the other hand, you're you're in there with people you know, and you you're just talking about what's going on in the news. You're probably using Arabic, right? Yeah, oh, it's it's all in Arabic. But by that yeah. time, you're comfortable with it. So, and that's the idea to make you comfortable in in speaking it. In Okay. In, in thinking it, so it gets. Sometimes it get hard. Someone asks you, you know, in English, what does that word mean? And you're like, okay, I know what it means, but I'm trying to think what the English word yeah. for this is because yeah. you're, you're trying to. Now, are something. there different dialects of Arabic? Yes. Yeah. Um, because if, if someone's from uh, Lebanon, they speak a different than Arabic than uh, Iraq. Is that? Uh, a little, a little bit. bit. It's not. It's not the same as other languages. We have different. Dialects, so to speak, like you know, Mandarin Chinese is different from what Cantonese that they speak down in the south. So what you have is standard Arabic is the same everywhere. Okay. Uh, so I mean, if you pick up a newspaper in Morocco, it's exact same language as what you'll find okay. in Saudi Arabia. Or if you're watching the news, the standard Arabic is exactly the same. Uh, the colloquial, which is like you know, sort of the street speech or the informal speech, that of course differs from place to place. It's like, you know, sometimes if we watch uh, like, a, like a show from Australia or something, or you listen to Crocodile Dundee yeah. talking and you're like, you know, what the heck is this guy yeah. saying? Yeah, he's speaking English, but it's, yeah. he's, he's speaking Australian English, yeah. yeah. And so there's, there is that. So there's the, the, the common dialect is, is different, but standard Arabic is the same, so everyone can communicate. So I think it was the, the Arabic word for thank you is it shukran? Shukran. Yeah. Shukran. So if you said shukran, all of the Middle Everyone, East, it'd be. Everyone knows. Be, yeah. Okay. Uh, so that yeah, that would be pretty interesting because you, so you went, so the Army or the, the military world went from everything Soviet, 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 now they're kind of phasing in. Like, do, do, you, do you think the uh, first Gulf War may maybe wake, wake up a little bit that we're going to have maybe some problems in that part oh, of the world? Sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I mean, of course, a lot of resources went to um, Arabic in the Arab world, and still, I mean, we haven't disengaged yet uh, from there. But now it's more, you know, it, it's more balanced. So yes, there is an emphasis on the Middle East. There's also an emphasis on China. Uh, there's, you know, an emphasis on Korea. And then more of an awareness, sort of, of you know, we never know when the next crisis could yeah. be. It could be anywhere. So you think maybe uh, the army learned from instead of just being one track, to have like different areas. It, was exactly. Yeah, I think they they learned from that. But by the same token, you know, you can't say that they were were wrong to no, focus no. on the Soviets because we we did win the Cold War. Yeah, I mean, did, I, yeah. I think it's probably the biggest victory we ever had because we didn't have to fight the Russians. We, no. uh, you know, basically we, we outdeveloped them to the point where they, they couldn't compete anymore. And so that, you know, had we not focused so much on being ready to confront the Russians, um, you know, the Soviet Union might not have collapsed, we'll never know. But I think yeah. it was it was the right thing at the time. Now, like. I was thinking 1990, okay. when they were still teaching that, and maybe that was a little bit different. Now, there are some uh, countries in Africa the, that, like Somalia or Libya, the, I mean, Libya, they're, they're Arab, correct? Yes. Okay, now Syria, uh, I mean, Somalia, they're, are they, they're, are, are they African? Well, but, but they're Muslims. So do they speak yeah. Arab, Arab, or they speak African, or? I mean, technically, Somalia is considered an, an Arab country. They're in the Arab League. Uh, technically, Arabic is a, a language there, but in, in reality, I, I mean, no. I mean, people speak more Somali dialects. Okay. I mean, okay. we're, it is a Muslim country Muslim for country. sure. Okay. But I mean, it doesn't really resemble, say, Saudi Arabia. Okay. It's, it's sort of more on the fringe. Uh, so you, you've done a lot of studying in, in the, uh, the Middle East and the world. And stuff. Is, there, is there certain things that you think maybe the average American citizen doesn't realize about the different cultures and, the, and that they, you think you'd like to tell them? Or, or is it? 
Oh yeah, I, yeah. Th I think there's a, a lot. I mean, a lot that I didn't know um, before I went to the Middle East, and then certainly before I started studying. So I went to the I went to the Language Institute for a year and a half. And okay. I met a lot of people. We learned a lot, but I had not yet been to the Middle East. Then I, from there, I went to Egypt, and we were stationed in Egypt for a year at, okay. the, at the U.S. Embassy in Egypt, and then. Then I worked in Saudi Arabia. So, uh, but then when I when I was there in Egypt, I traveled to I traveled to twelve Arab countries, which were the the ones a lot of them you couldn't go to. So I, I went to all the countries that I, I could go to. So I got to see a lot, and I, I didn't know what to expect. Okay, did you when you when you would learn Arabic? Did you learn about the culture also, or just yes. okay yeah. culture also? Okay, yeah. You, I mean, you learn a lot about the culture, but. Uh, I mean, like everything else, culture differs from place to it place. Does. So Egypt is not a lot like Saudi Arabia, um, it, really at all. There's a lot of differences between them, and I mean it differs from from place to place. So that was why it was good. And I mean, the, actually, I mean the army paid for that. They funded that for me as an as I was an Arabic expert to are supposed to be yeah. to actually go to these countries and get out and meet people and, and learn about them. And so you, you said you wanted me to talk about you have your master's degree yes and you have your PhD yes and so you got those going through the army arm. yes so yeah so you you really got a oh yeah good education from the army yeah, absolutely and you got to see if, can you want to talk a little about sure. that yeah sure I'd be glad to. yeah um, I, I think I mean that's something that I, I don't think. A lot of people realize is it how committed the army is to education. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't think there's any organization that spends as much or invests as much time yeah. and money on, on the education of its members than the army does. And by education, I'm not talking about military training, but I mean ed education in universities, civilian uh, education is, as well. Um, and this is definitely like a Especially post Vietnam era, this has been yeah. uh, a big issue because I think we learned there was a, there's a whole lot more than just you know maneuvering troops and fighting. You, you need to know a whole, lot, a whole lot more than that. So, I mean, I was very lucky in that uh, yes, the Army sent me to Princeton University for yeah. a master's degree, which is very prestigious, right? And very expensive, yeah. which which I could not have afforded, but they they paid for it. Not only paid for me to go, but I continued to. Get my salary while I was there, yeah. and it's um, you know to give credit to the army, it was the sort of thing of you know they'll tell you that's that's your job is to be a student. So I mean we had no other responsibilities. I didn't have to go out and run the rifle range or do anything like that. My job was to be a full time student, uh, and there were I think four of us there at the time, army students. So it wasn't small, and then later on. Through West Point, I got to go to I, to Harvard University to get a PhD okay. for three years, and again, okay. that was something I got to, to focus on the, the PhD completely. Which and that was the army. That is the the army paid for that, and again, I was not the only one there. There were a number of army officers there. There were army officers at MIT who were doing science and engineering, uh, as, as there are, you know, at universities throughout the country. So that's. Uh, I mean, I have to give credit to the Army, they invest a lot, and specifically I would say the Army, because this is one thing that other services are often, well they joke about, but they're often envious of, is that none of the other three services invest nearly as much in postgraduate education as okay. the Army does. It's one of the things the Army's, I mean, there are some, the yeah. Air Force spends some money on it, but not to anywhere the extent that the the army does. So, if you look, probably any officer you meet who's a colonel or above in the army has got at least a master's degree that was paid for by the army. And a lot of the generals will have doctorates that again, oh, yeah. the army paid for them. Yeah. In fact, uh, I can't thank Rob Hand, but uh, I think you're the 26th person I've interviewed, and I can think of Rob Hand. I've interviewed so far probably about. Five veterans that are doctors yeah. have a PhD, so I think that's really really neat. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it's not, uh, you know, when I talk to people, sometimes they say, oh, they must have sent you to study military history or something. It's no, they don't, because I mean that's something the Army can teach in its own schools. So I mean they're sending people to get degrees in philosophy and religion and 
electrical engineering and all the things that yeah. that are better done in the civilian world. And I think part of it is it, we've seen the experience like from from Vietnam, but from Iraq and Afghanistan, yeah. when the military goes into a village and is there for a long time, you don't, you don't know what you're going to need. I mean, you may have to repair the water system or the electrical grid or the post office or put together a, an election or, I mean, things that, that have nothing to do with military tactics. Yeah, and so yeah. uh, you need people trained in, in different uh, skills. In fact, interestingly, during during the Iraq War, and one of the things that the Army was heavily recruiting for was anthropologists, civilian anthropologists okay. from the universities, which sounds like, I mean, that sounds like the last field you, you would think the Army is recruiting for, but it's because we're working so much in villages, I mean, you need people who know how to analyze cultures and customs and traditions and how do we relate to these people without offending anybody? And so you, you bring in folks who do that for yeah. a living. So you had these anthropologists going out with combat battalions. Yeah. So that's what, what do they call that now? Uh, when in hearts and minds, is that yes. what they call it? Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, that's that's really interesting that, that you, you got your uh, your master's and your PhD. And yeah. I guess and guess your bachelor's from... Yeah. So you, yeah. So from uh, that's really interesting. Yes, really I never paid for college yeah. anywhere. Yeah, and that's uh, I'm very grateful. For that. Yeah. So what are some of the? Uh, did you like the, the food? Did you did were you was it? Did you get used to the food like in the uh, Middle Eastern world or the culture? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I thought you were going to ask about army food. Army well, food is great. Yeah, uh, that's it's, it's, the hard thing is keeping your weight down. Yeah. I mean, they, you eat well and. <laughs> Yeah. In an army mess hall, but uh, as far as living in in the Middle East, I guess, yeah. I mean, of course, I, I learned to like the food and the uh, and the culture. Uh, and of course, it, it differs from from country to country. Um, but I mean, I guess the the main thing I think I noticed is that it's just very it's very common in the Middle East that people are are much more outgoing. So I mean, you can. Total strangers, you know, we'll talk to. I can remember at one point we were, my, my son was a year old, and we were out in Cairo, that's where we lived in Cairo, and there was a dust storm, a very bad dust storm. Yeah. And, I mean, total strangers standing in their doorway, they're telling me, you know, come in, come in, come into their house to get out of the storm. I mean, which really, I mean, in, in Kentucky that might happen, in New York or Boston that, that does not happen. <laughs> Uh, with things like that, or somebody, yeah. you, you'd be on the on the bus, and somebody's eating an orange, and look over and give you half the orange. And it's like, um, or particularly, particularly, I found in Arab culture, they they love kids, and so I had this one year old son who was very cute, and is now a, a senior in college. Yeah. Uh, but at that time, we, you know, carrying the baby around everywhere, and so I mean, total strangers would come up and they'd be like, you know, give me give me the baby, and yeah. they would. And again, as some people say, like you, you let them do that, but it's just the the culture is you would Different, you yeah. would never think that anybody would would hurt the kid. It's just yeah. you know they, they don't want to pick up and play with the baby, and yeah. Yeah, it's just the way it is. You know? uh, for for the people that are watching this, is there one thing? You, I, mean, I mean, this is you know one thing that you think is a misconception about people in the Middle East. Is it one one you think maybe one misconception or yes. Yeah, I, I would say the biggest one is that um, in in the Middle East, uh, you know, people don't associate what the government of any country does with what the people do, which is very different from us in a, in a democracy. So we see like a lot of protests against U.S. policy in the U.S. government. I mean, you might even see burning flags or something, and so people get the idea, oh, they hate Americans. And it may be true at times. At times, some people may hate the current government or the policies, but that never applies to you as a person. So it's the idea: well, well, I don't like what your government does, but you, you're a great person. And overall, you know, everybody. So you you were always treated well. Always American. treated well, particularly as I think as an American people. I love America. I want to go to America. And at the same time, there are people who would criticize the. The policy. I was there during the Bush era, and they were very critical of the Bush policies. But as an individual, uh, 
they, they love you and they love the fact you're an American. So they love American culture, they love American entertainment as individuals, and they don't they don't see any association with, I mean, they don't blame you for what your government does. I think in part because in Arab countries there's such a distance between the government and the people. people. Like, I mean, the average Egyptian doesn't feel any responsibility for what, you know, President Mubarak was doing. I mean, they would, you know, make fun of him behind his back. And so I think that's something they have a hard time understanding why we get defensive, like we're someone is criticizing you know America meaning American policy we take it personal and we take it personally and they'd be like why are you getting mad at you know why are you getting mad at me and to realize that 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 never applies to you I mean because I was I, I worked for several years there I worked in the Saudi Ministry of Defense as a liaison and I worked in the US Embassy and things were always done on a personal Basis. I mean, it was always they, they always did things for. It was always David talking to uh, whoever Abdulaziz or whoever it was, and it was always on a personal favor they did things for you. So, I uh, mean, relations could be very bad between our governments, but it'd be like, hey, I need something. Can you help me out? And it was always based on that, uh, which I, I think. I, I think that's important to know because people would probably look differently at what they see on the news. If they if they took that in, into consideration, okay. yeah, because I guess there we're so used to being part of the government and voting and and, 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 and I guess uh, being a democratic society that yeah. I guess a lot of times we we think about yeah yeah absolutely yeah uh, so yeah I, I really I really think that's a good point uh, where's the uh, so did you go back to after after you. How long did you stay in the Middle Eastern countries? Uh, let's see, I was in Egypt for a year, I was in Saudi Arabia for a year and a half, uh, and then I went, actually I went back from Saudi Arabia to West Point. Okay, yeah. so when you went to West Point, that's when you taught at West Point? Yes. Okay, what did you teach at West Point? I taught Arabic. Arabic, there. okay. For nine years. So okay. I spent a lot of time, I spent a total of nine years teaching there. Okay, and so, uh, I guess your strong suit was not only did you learn Arabic in the United States, but then you went and they kind of threw you in the, they call it baptism of fire. Yes. You kind of went in there and lived it and talked it, and so you felt very comfortable about teaching, right? Yeah, because that's, you know, what the students want to you know. A lot of it's not just the language, but culture. They want to know what's, you know, what's it like, you know, what do people do in these situations, and so forth. So, you know, it's good to be able to talk about what, uh, what you've actually seen. So, yeah. yeah, I was there at West Point for a long time, and I think that, that maybe it, one of the things some people don't realize is that West Point is one of the places in the military that you can actually stay permanently. So we had moved around a lot prior right. to that, but um, the PhD instructors stay, generally stay there permanently because it's a big investment from the army, oh, yeah, so yeah. They, they keep you there until retirement, so that's right. Okay. So you, you uh, taught at West Point for nine years? Yes. Okay, and then where, where were you, where did you head from there? Well, then I retired. Okay, you retired. Okay. And then I came here. Okay, so how, did, so you, you you're, uh, can you maybe tell them what you, you're, you're, you're uh, about Western and how you got there and? Oh, sure, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I had, you know, I retired in the, uh, in 2012, okay. and so um, you know the the army considers you old. You know when you're in your late 40s. So I yeah. had, to, had to retire from there, uh, and I knew I wanted to keep teaching, and so I wanted to keep teaching Arabic. And so I really I applied to jobs throughout the country, and I went I visited. I went and visited a lot of campuses, and I, I won't mention any of the other locations uh, to say anything bad about them. But okay. I can I can remember coming to Bowling Green. I've never been to Bowling Green in okay. my life, but then coming back and tell the family, I mean, this is a really nice place. Could you could uh, you you're a uh, northerner? I mean, yeah, northerner. And so you were you were you uh, like surprised about the southern uh, how we act here and the way we. No, because I mean I spent a lot of time. In this. That's one thing in the in the military. You meet people from all. Okay. So I, you know, I, yeah, I came from Boston, where our, 
you know, we weren't a very diverse population there. Uh, but as soon as you go in the army, you're mixed with all races and not necessarily all religions, but uh, people from all parts of the country. It's one of the it's a it's a great equalizer. You get to meet people from all over. So, and I was stationed in Georgia, and so I I was familiar with the, the South, but I'd never heard about Bowling Green. But I mean, and I, I didn't research it. But I mean, it turns out it's one of the top rated communities in the country uh, to live in. But I can just remember it coming out here and come back and tell the family, you know, it's so it's so green out there, and it's so it's so nice, and they've got every kind of restaurant you can imagine. And weather's pretty nice, it, too. The weather's very nice, and Western's a beautiful campus. I uh, was telling them what a great place uh, this was, and then I got the offer for the job, and so we had to come out pretty quickly after that, and I've been here for five years. Okay. Since. Uh, so, uh, now where were you living before you, you, you moved to Bowling Green? I was in West Point. Okay, Same so you were from. so you were in New York, so you probably yes. were glad to leave all the snow away. A lot of snow. The place gets a lot. West Point gets a lot of snow, and it's in the mountains, so the snow is very, yeah. very dangerous. And, and you grew up in Quincy, so they have a ton of snow too. Uh, right, but Quincy is more urban, so it wasn't quite as quite as bad. But I think West Point is very it's very isolated. Like I said, so you, you had to drive like half an hour to get to anything. Okay, and then of course you come to. To Bowling Green, and we've got you know on one street, we've got every store and every restaurant yeah. you can ever imagine is right there. So we were yeah. we were like shocked to drive through this town. And yeah. So see you everything. so you seem like you're pretty happy at Western. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Hopefully, I hope I, I hope I will stay here. Yeah. Forever and not yeah. and not move. Yeah. Well, so, I think Western really got a, a, a good uh, uh, assistant professor, especially oh, with your. Your background in the uh, in the uh, your immersion in the different cultures in West Point and stuff. Thank you. Uh, is there in closing? Is there is there something that that, that people watch this interview would maybe would like to take? If you, if you could take away one thing from this interview, what would you have the people take away from this interview? Uh, I think just for me, it, it's how much the the army has changed. Like I said, when when I came in, it was to. Uh, a world where you know we were preparing for the big war to fight the Russians and come Ivan. Yeah, that was that was our mentality, yeah. and I, I couldn't even have envisioned what today's soldiers. I mean, people who are going into the army now, well, they are called upon to do so much more uh, stuff. I mean, they're working with orphans and disaster relief and uh, aid missions and. And fighting, you know, terrorism, and I, and I think it's much more difficult. I mean, what a young soldier today is is put through in the situations they're put in. As, as you said, you know, back then people wore uniforms, and it was maybe it was more dangerous if you were going to fight the Soviet army. But it was very clear what you were going to do. I mean, nowadays a soldier who you know goes to a village, and, I mean encounter kids who may be armed, they may not yeah. have a uniform, and th those are much, much more difficult choices. So I, I think it's, um, you know, I retired as the Army was changing, but I think for these soldiers today, I can see it's, it's a much more yeah. difficult environment mentally and emotionally uh, for them than what we had to deal with. Uh, I've asked uh, most of the guys I've interviewed in uh, uh, do you think when you see the flag, you think you, do you think maybe you, you feel a certain pride that maybe this is someone had served at fields? Do you think you, you think it would be right? Or? Oh yeah, absolutely. Like the baseball game when you yeah. uh, when you stand for the national anthem, um, I, and, and I think because like like I said, I grew up in the post Vietnam era when the military had a bad a, yeah. a bad but, reputation, yeah. but I think. Now, I mean, when you stand to sing the national anthem, and everybody, everybody around you is, yeah. is singing, or when they say to salute the troops, and everyone claps, you really feel yeah. good that okay, you know, we, yeah, I really feel like I, I represent yeah. these people who are around me. Yeah, I think that's some of the thing I've I've talked to some of the Vietnam veterans that you know, like the the maybe the, the people took took their frustrations out on the. On yeah. the soldiers instead yeah. of maybe the government, and they they blame the soldiers who were just doing their job. Yeah, yeah. I I definitely came in at a very good time. They, um, 
they went definitely in the Vietnam era. They went through a very tough experience, and it makes you wonder, you know, what it was like to volunteer for the military at that time when it was not popular. Um, when when I joined the, the military, it was during the Reagan years, the build up, and so this was becoming a much more Patriotic. popular. You know, yeah. people said, you know, thanks for your service and yeah. so forth. I mean, I didn't have to deal with that. Yeah, I don't know. You know, I don't know what that would have been like. Uh, thankfully, uh, thankfully, we, we we haven't had that since. Yeah, I think we hopefully we've learned a lesson. Yeah. Here. To uh, maybe maybe you can get mad at the uh, the uh, government, but don't take it out on the people who do sure. their job. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add or anything? Oh no, no, thank yeah. you. Yeah, I, I, I really uh, appreciate your time and your uh, your service, and it's really interesting you talking about your uh, your uh, your education and everything. So I, I hope you do well at Western. Oh, thank All you right. very much. Appreciate it. Thank you.